I am so pleased that you have joined us today to talk about what I believe um, is the most important topic and most important issue facing our city today. And that is the future of our public school district. Now, today's important discussion would not be possible without some of our very generous donors. So please help me introduce, or help me welcome, as I introduce, um, Chris Dykstra, Senior Account Executive for Cox Business. Chris, come up, please. Thank you, Teresa. Hello, and uh, good morning, and thanks for attending uh, the Chamber Forum here today. I'm Chris Dykstra with Cox Business, and we're pleased to be a signature sponsor of the Chamber Forum here. I think we can all agree that education is probably one of the most important responsibilities we have, uh, education being our future. Uh, it takes vision, hard work, and teamwork to lead in education. Uh, with Dr. Sean McDaniel, he knows all about this. He has uh, been a distinguished educator for more than three decades. He's earned numerous honors and recognition, and his career has taken him to schools in Colorado and Oklahoma. Uh, he now serves as the superintendent of Oklahoma City Public Schools, and he is our featured speaker today, here to share uh, the district's Pathway to Greatness project. So with that being said, uh, I'll hand it back to Teresa, and we can have lunch. Thank you all for being here. Chris, thank you so much. Um, I'm also pleased to acknowledge and recognize our corporate ADG. Is anybody from ADG here today? I think we had a couple of people. Great. Thank you all so much for being here and for sponsoring. Um, for more about, for more than a year, Oklahoma City Public Schools District has been examining the capacity of the district with a major goal in mind. Provide full Okay. Providing a equitable education experience for all students in a more efficient manner. The Pathway to Greatness project conducted a very, and when I say very, I'm saying very, very expletive very, um, detailed and data-driven process that examined um, all kinds of factors related to the district. District's demographic profile facility utilization as well as the shape and, and the, um, how good our facilities were and how much they needed to be improved. Academic performance, feeder patterns, bus routes, and more to get a, a better understanding of how the district work more efficiently. Currently, and this, I just find this statistic amazing. And for you all that are business people, this is such a critical factor. Currently, the district's average occupancy use rate is 60%. That means we have some buildings that are 30% capacity, and we have some buildings that are 125% capacity. We also know that the demographic projections indicate that the population of the district will de decline over the next few years, impacting the amount of state aid that the district will receive. It's very clear that the status quo is not going to help this district move forward. It's, there, there are so many issues that the district needs to deal with. So the district had to do some research, compare possible solutions and look for ways to um, understand how to better use our facilities to have the revenue to be able to affect a high performing academic environment for our students. The project has involved input from district staff, teachers, principals, community leaders, and hours of public meetings with parents across the district. You might have seen some of it on Facebook, seen it on the district's website, even on the news. The news has covered a number of those meetings. But all of those conversations have been leading to the recommendation of a single plan for the school board to make a decision on the first week of March. Today, we are going to hear firsthand from the superintendent, from Superintendent McDaniel, 
um, where we are in this process and how the district has arrived at the final three options that have been reviewed, um, community input has been taken on, and where we're going to go from here as far as making a single recommendation. The superintendent is going to talk about the very critical component of this project, which is the trade-ups. So what does all this pain get us as a community and as a public education system? Um, so that's our little teaser. With that, I'd like to invite you to please enjoy your lunch, conversation at your table, and we will be back with you in a few presentation and a microphone that works. I said before our lunch break from the superintendent of Oklahoma City Public Schools, Sean McDaniel, who is absolutely passionate about our district and about the impact that the school district has for our city. His extended bio is in the back of your program, so please take a chance to, to take a look at it when you have a moment. But for now, please help me welcome Superintendent Sean McDaniel to the stage. Check, 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 check. Oh. Thank you, Teresa. It's uh, great to be with you all. Can everybody hear me well? Austin, can you hear me good? Everybody good? Oh, I need... Oh, thank you. So I have a, a presentation that is roughly an hour and 15 minutes. <laughs> I've given it, this is the 38th time I've given it, that's a real number. And I'm going to do my best to, to get through it in about 25 minutes and leave plenty of time for Q&A. Um, even though this is the 38th time I've done this, because of the content, because of what we're talking about, which is opportunities for kids, uh, trajectory uh, influence for kids I still get very excited about the content of this and and I think you're gonna see why as we go through this so pathway to great greatness let me set this up a little bit about a year and a half ago <clears throat> our Board of Education had uh, the vision to do something different for a long time um, I've been a superintendent for 30 17 years 33 years in this business and I've been watching Oklahoma City as a as an interested spectator for a long time. Uh, and I've seen wins and I've seen great things and, and pockets of greatness all over the school district, but there's always been a sense of we, we can do better. We can do better for all kids. And so when we talk about pathway to greatness, it's with that premise in mind. And our board said, let's figure out a way to quit talking about it and let's take action. Uh, let's quit kicking the can down the road. Let's put a strategy in place where we can address the needs, the opportunities, or the lack thereof for all kids in the school district. So they said uh, to take action, we need policy development. Uh, we need to hire some firms who have expertise in the field of reinvention. And they begin to take steps toward reinvention. So fast forward to June of last year, I, I got to come in and inherit this process. And I can just tell you that in my career, this will go down without question as a highlight. Not because it's a great process, but because it has to do with better lives for all of our kids. And that's why I do what I do. So let's jump in here. So pathway to greatness, reinvention. How do we do things better for all kids? What we wanted to do is take the P2G, kind of the nickname for pathway to greatness, and not explore it or advance in isolation. So we found some things that we believe strongly in that were already in existence in our district. And, and here you see a mission statement and a vision statement. That thing, our, our vision statement, what we aspire to, if everything were right with the world, this is what we'd look like, and then our mission, the legs that will get us there. And so old good work that we wanted to connect to. Our Board of Education a uh, year and a half ago said, you can read these for yourselves, but I want to highlight that first bullet. Status quo, business as usual. I would hope that no matter how good or bad or mediocre we are, that we would never be satisfied with where we are. And I would hope for our families, in our businesses, in our lives, that we would not just say, hey, I've arrived. Our board said, clearly, our status quo is unacceptable. Remember that we're talking about 46,000 kids in 86 schools. 
our status quo is not acceptable. And the caveat to that is we know we can walk into any school in the district and we can see a pocket of greatness. We can see something excellent going on inside of every school. But I would be hard pressed to find a consensus in this room, outside of this room, to say that Oklahoma City Public Schools is an excellent school district. I do not believe that consensus exists. So we want to move from status quo, pockets of greatness, to an excellent school district for all of our students. Some terms, um, I'm not going to go through all these, or we will have the hour and 15 minute presentation, but I do want to point out two or three different terms. One is the very first one, a trade up. You can read that definition. My definition is something like this. It's something that does not exist that we're going to bring to our kids, or something that is, exists at a low level that we're going to up the level. So it's a trade-up. We're going to bring things to our kids to increase or, in some cases, bring something that does not exist. Repurposing, reconfigured, and then the very last one, closure, three terms that are very distinct. A repurposed school is a school that closes and then reopens with another purpose. So an example of that would be, in our case, we close an elementary school, we redistribute kids and teachers, we reopen the building, and maybe it's a community center or a clinic or a birth to three-year-old program for our neighborhood and community. So that's a repurpose. A reconfigure is we change grade bands. Right now we have grade bands all over the board. We'll talk about that here in a minute, but it's changing a grade band. It may be a pre-K through six now, and it becomes a five through eight. So it's still a school. We just reconfigure and then closure, literally that. There is no purpose. We close the school and then we look to either sell or demolish it and bring back some sort of a green space or park area for our kids. Board of Education, I, I cannot even begin to give them enough credit for the vision that they had a year and a half, two years ago, that they were tired of doing things the same way. Um, these are the six guiding principles that they developed um, that we adopted as our filtering system. So rather than sitting around a table every time a topic comes up and having an, hey, let's all get together and talk about it, every time we meet as in a board workshop, in a, a committee meeting, and on and on, we look at these six principles as we move through the pathway to greatness. And it has become uh, the lens through which we look. The process itself, um, a lot of work has gone in, committee work, hours and hours of research, trying to find best practices, who does what well around the country, bringing it back for our conversation. So you can see uh, we've looked at data. I alluded to policy development. D12 outlines nine criteria that our friends from ADG have come in and said, we will collect data on those nine criteria and then report back and then turn it back out to the public. And so D12 was a, a foundational piece of, of our work. Then we look at stakeholders. So if you look at that first line, stakeholders, committee work, and then input from district leaders, it's kind of like that three-legged stool. Um, without any one of those pieces, we don't succeed. We don't do well. So we looked at data. We've got uh, community input, committee input, and then we listened to the, the district leaders and talked about their experiences with success and failure over the years. We then came up with a path A, B, and C on their own. Any one of those can stand alone as a reinvention plan. So what we needed to do from that point was narrow it down to a single plan that I could recommend to the board. And by the way, uh, today was supposed to be a different presentation, but our board meeting last night was canceled. Um, and postponed to tomorrow. So tomorrow at 3 o'clock, I will be recommending the single pathway. Would you like to hear it now? Sorry, I can't do that. <laughs> I, there is no way. I'm, I've got at least one board member in here. No, I can't do that. I can't do that. So we're going to talk about A, B, and C, and then what we're going to do from here. Um, so we, we then, here we are. We're now going back out to the community, uh, made the second round of community engagement meetings. In, in total, we got in a six night period of time, we got in front of about 6,000 people. Uh, we stayed till the last question was asked, sometimes from six o'clock until 20 till one in the morning, until the last question was asked or the last comment was made. Um, and there was a pretty fair share of comments, as you might imagine, compared to questions. 
Uh, and so here we are, uh, ramping up to the final path, uh, which at 3 o'clock tomorrow I'll be able to recommend to our full board. Uh, and then the next day, all the way through March 4th, uh, we will wait. We will listen to input from our board. They will listen to input from others. And then the vote will occur on March 4th on the single pathway. So let's talk about trade-ups. Again, another visual that ties this work, reinvention, to the great commitment. Some of you in the room may have participated in our strategic planning a couple years ago. The great commitment, very robust goals and strategies and um, indicators of success. These are our four pillars in the center, those four icons, that we have tied to the different trade-up categories that we are going to bring to the district. So in the green boxes, you see our trade-up categories, and I'll detail those out here in just a minute. So we have mission, we have vision, great work in the district. We have the great commitment, strategic planning, and now we add to it our reinvention plan. So it's very interconnected. One relies upon the other, and we like that uh, style of work. So here's some key recommendations that came out of our Trailblazer Committee. Trailblazers are a group of teachers, school leaders, and district leaders. They did the, the heavy lifting on the research, best practices around the country, and they brought several recommendations to us. This simply tells us where we were falling short and why we needed the recommendation. Research tells us that in any elementary, you need to have at least three teachers per grade level team. Okay? In our district, only two of five met that criteria. In many of our schools, we only have one grade level teacher per grade level. So think about this. If I'm a first grade teacher, and I'm a first year teacher, and I'm an emergency certified teacher, which is a real deal for us, who do I have in my building that I get to collaborate with? Nobody. I'm on my own now. I get help from my principal. I can seek out mentor teachers. But if I'm a first year teacher, and I'm emergency certified, and I'm the only one in my building, where does that show up? That shows up in student outcomes. That's where it shows up. And so we wanted to say, through Pathway to Greatness, every elementary will be staffed with a minimum of three teachers per grade level team. We think that's a huge win when we talk about student outcomes. School size does matter, very clear in research. This, uh, in, in our history, this goes all the way back to maps when recommendations were made about school size. We kind of followed that lead and adjusted a little bit. And so you can see this, the ideal school sizes. In the light blue, you see where we are today. In the dark blue, through Pathway to Greatness, that's where we will result. That's where we will end up. So uh, we think this is a, a big step. It allows for the staffing that we talked about in the last slide, where we have larger grade level teams, more resources. Um, and so we're excited about this as well. This is not a recommendation. This is how we currently are. So if you start bottom left, we have elementaries that are pre-K 5, pre-K 6, middles that are 6, 8, 7, 8, mid-highs that are 6, 12, 7, 12, and then we have high school. So lots of different models. I want you to think about this. What we know in Oklahoma City public is that we have lots and lots of families who move within the district throughout the year. We're a very transient bunch. So imagine if <clears throat> Right now, I'm in an elementary school that serves pre-K through six. I'm a sixth grader. I'm in an elementary. What do we know about elementaries? They go to recess. They go to specials. Sometimes they eat lunch with fifth graders. They walk the halls with fourth and fifth graders. And I move during the course of the year up to a mid-high. I'm a sixth grader, and now I'm walking the halls with high school students. I have no recess. I'm, I don't have my fifth and fourth grade buddies. I'm in a high school setting. And so we thought we could do better. We, we knew the research said we probably should do better. And so we have provided a consistent grade band model. And this is what it's going to look like. Next one, uh, this is on, on the trade-up side. STEM, we, we've actually adjusted that. It should say STEAM. We wanted to add the arts component to that. Science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Um, and we have committed that every single elementary in our district will have a designated maker space where we can then up the level with, with many of our partners who have said, you know, if you'll pay more attention to STEAM, 
we will pay more attention to you. We'll come in with engineers. We'll come in and partner with equipment and supplies. And we will adopt you as a school. But right now, of our 54 elementaries, only two of them have a dedicated space for STEAM activities. We're saying everyone will have through Pathway to Greatness. Uh, the second one, for a long time, I took this one for granted because of where I went to elementary school. We had a music teacher, we had an art teacher, and we had a PE teacher every day. I, I didn't get to go to them every day, but in the building, every day we had those three. Only 18 of our 54 elementaries have those three teachers in the building. What we know about music and art in particular is the more exposure uh, to young elementary kids routinely, the more advanced math scores, literacy rates, and reading scores we will see as outcomes. So when we're only giving one third of our kids exposure to art and to music, we're handicapping ourselves. So our commitment is every single school will have a full-time art, music, and PE teacher funded. Now the trick, as you know, we're in a teacher shortage right now, is to find qualified people to fill the positions. But our commitment is we will fund those three spots in every elementary. And then the librarian, we're going to double the number uh, of librarians as well. I think we know the value of the media specialist and the value add that they bring to a school. So what we just saw was really on the elementary side. These are just a few that we heard were really important through our surveys, through our input. Um, on the secondary side, we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of secondary school kids who never get a science lab opportunity the entire year. It is textbook and lecture and small group work in the classroom, but they do not have access to a science lab. So we think that's important. And so our commitment is every secondary school, middle school and up, will have a fully functioning science lab for lab opportunities. And then you can see the rest of these. Um, and I'll go through these again here in just a little bit. The two important things here, we, uh, I think we probably have a pretty good sense of uh, the challenges that our kids come to school with. Whether it's a, uh, a challenge that would be categorized as trauma, uh, some sort of abuse. One in four of our uh, students today have at least one parent incarcerated right now as we sit here in this room. Okay, so, so the challenges our kids come to us with, we want to we wanna take pride in and make a better effort to meet those challenges for all of our kids. So full-time counselor, every elementary school. Right now, lots of our kids get the Tuesday counselor or the Friday counselor. Once a week, a counselor comes into the building. Uh, we need to do better than that. And so our commitment is we're going to do better. Combined with this unbelievable opportunity through Embrace OKC. So it's an it's a Oklahoma City Schools compact initiative. And they have come to us and said, we want to step in. We want to step up. We want to be part of the solution when we talk about challenges for kids. And so uh, through the United Way, through the foundation, through the chamber, through the city, through the schools. Am I missing one? I got them, didn't I? We are detailing this out. So this isn't a one-size-fits-all. This is emotional, behavioral supports based upon the needs in a community, in a school zone, in a schoolhouse. Not, here's your menu of 10 things. Now all 46,000 kids, here's what you get. Through this OKC Embrace, we're going into schools and identifying what the needs are and then matching partners to the needs in that school. It's, it's sensational. It's the only one of its kind in our country. Um, and so we're really excited about the combination of us stepping up as a district and then us thankfully and gratefully receiving this assistance from uh, our community. So the number one thing on most people's list, teacher, parent, you name it, is can we please lower our class sizes? And we believe we can take a stab at that. It's not going to be significant five, six, eight kids per class. But you know what we try and do year to year is just keep our class sizes from growing. So if we can reduce in any way, we believe that's a win. And we believe we can do that in K-6. That's our target area. 
and we think we can bring that. Over the years, as we see budget reductions, two of the first positions to go through cuts are assistant principals and office clerks. So if you know education a little bit, you know that the tasks and the responsibilities of the assistant principals and the office clerks don't go away, ever. So if they go away, where do those tasks and responsibilities land? Right directly on the desk of the teacher. So we are squeezing time out every year from the teacher to interact with the student because we're giving tasks and responsibilities. So we want to bring these positions back to those levels. And we're excited to do that because it frees up the time for the teacher, most important individual outside of a family member in the life uh, of a student. And so we want them to be able to do that well. Just real quickly here, uh, some national studies tell us that a good way to do business with low performing, highly challenged schools is to take your superstar adults, most effective, most experienced, and pair them with your kids who have the greatest challenges. So our transformational model that we're going to kick off does just that. Highly effective principal, assistant principal, grade level teachers that are measured, metrics in place, evaluation system in place, high training, and we're going to match them with four of our most challenged, lowest performing schools. And we believe we'll see the needle move, particularly in reading and math. So very excited about that. So here is the list that got the oohs and ahs on January 22nd when we presented this at the board meeting. On the left, you see the schools that regardless of the path selected, those schools will all close and be repurposed. The second one, impact for all paths, A, B, or C, uh, those first, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, represent elementaries that will become middle schools. So a lot of work to be done there, a lot to, some retrofitting, uh, creating some practice fields around the schools. Um, and then the mid-high changes. Mid-high model came about several years ago where you put 6th or 7th graders through 12th grade in the same building. That has not proven to be successful for us for the most part. And there are a couple exceptions, but uh, the mid-highs will become comprehensive high schools, 9 through 12, and then we'll have the 5-8 middle school model. And then uh, some relocations. KIPP currently is in FD Moon. We need that space, second floor, to expand the elementary. Uh, actually, that will now become the middle. And so we're going to relocate KIPP uh, because of more facility recommendations. We're going to also move Seaworth, uh, Harding Fine Arts, Harding Charter Prep, and then Emerson South as uh, our alternative ed building. So those will be relocated. And then the choice options. We heard uh, from lots and lots and lots of people that we would like to give our families options. Right now, an option for a lot of families is single. It is, I go to this elementary, then I go to this middle, then I go to this high school. The old feeder pattern option. What we wanted to say is let's give kids and parents another choice, no matter where you live. And so what we've seen is an expansion of Belle Isle. Um, into a 5-8 divided into two buildings, a 5th, 6th grade intermediate center and a 7th and 8th grade uh, middle school. Class in SAS, right now they're capped at 1,000 kids, 6 through 12 in one building. We thought it would be a great idea to provide more opportunity to divide it into a middle school and a high school campus, two separate campuses. Immediately opens up 1,000 more seats for kids who are high performers, who uh, want to become engaged in that particular opportunity. And then Parmalee Elementary becomes the new middle school that feeds into the Southeast Application High School. So no matter where you live, you now have an option beyond staying in my feeder pattern. Comparisons A, B, and C. Uh, in A and B, 15 schools closed to be repurposed. Path C, 18. And then you see some of the, the differences there. Really, those bullets indicate how it's set up, those are closure differences, but how it's set up then to become uh, a different feeder pattern possibly. Where in one path you may go this elementary, this middle, this high. In another path it may be a different middle school, high school feeder pattern. 
trade-ups, <clears throat> again, those things that don't exist or do not exist at a, at a high level. <clears throat> Would you hand me my water? Oh, your water. I'll take your water. Thank you. All right. So the seven bullets in A, B, and C are all identical. You've probably seen that. With B, there's a little more reinvestment money um, through closures and through operational costs that we recoup so we can get additional school nurses if we were to go with path B. Path C, even a little bit more reinvestment money. Obviously, if you close 18 versus 15, you're going to get more. So not only additional nurses, but we get to take a second pass at reducing class sizes. The repurposing, <clears throat> uh, big topic of conversation, our repurposing model, and this is just me talking, appears to have been over the years that when we've closed the school, we've repurposed it into a boarded up, fenced in, weeds growing, padlocked building. And you can drive all over town and see those. What we say is we don't want to devalue a neighborhood. We want to add value to the neighborhood. We know that in many, most cases, the school is the hub. The school is part of revitalization. And so to close it and board it up devalues. We want to bring agencies, partners, people into the building. And we have a list of about, this is 16. We've, that's expanded to about 35 agencies who've come to us and said, we would like to locate or take space in a school that you close. And here are a few ideas. Um, tomorrow when we get to present this, we've actually received commitments uh, from a number of them that we're going to display and present to our board tomorrow. Uh, a couple more and we're done. Um, lots of questions. We have a great website that has all of the PowerPoints if you want to go and really study. Uh, we've got FAQ sheets that are updated periodically, the theme questions that come up and responses to them, all the documents, the data, all the things that have been released publicly you can find on our website if you want to study a little bit. These are just a, a few, a handful of the questions that we've received. <clears throat> so we know that this is a, a multi-year process. It's not we get to March 4th, we get a thumbs up from the board and we're done. It is multi-year. It is evaluation, monitoring, adjusting. Let's continue looking at the research. Can we do it better? All the things we do with initiatives that we move on down the road. There, there is never a point in time where we say we've arrived. We, we constantly want to evaluate and adjust and evaluate and adjust. So that's what this image says, um, that it will be a consistent process. And then we bring it around to this. Why do we do this? We do this because, and th this is a great little picture of our kids. These are Oklahoma City Public School kids. We do this for them. Um, for too long, it has mattered where you live uh, relative to what opportunities you get. And we don't want to be like that. We want to say that no matter where you live, in our public school system, in our neighborhoods, you have access to the same or similar opportunities. We do not, as a district, want to define your future based upon your zip code. And so that's what this is about, so that our kids have that opportunity that they've never had, many of them. Um, and we believe this process gets us closer to that. Um, that's it. There's the website. And I probably went way too long, didn't I? I felt myself kind of... You didn't. You did, did great. Okay? Yeah, okay, you good. actually shorted about five minutes. Don't leave. You're not, not leaving. done. Let's say thank you to Superintendent McDaniel. So um, what we wanted to do is give you all the opportunity to ask a, a, a few questions. Um, so think about your questions. We've got chamber staff around the room, so if you've got a question, please raise your hand. But before we do that, I think you can tell from this presentation and the process that superintendent just laid out, the amount of time, particularly staff time, that has gone into having a thoughtful, deliberate um, recommendation. So. Um, on behalf of the superintendent, yeah. I'd like to ask any um, administrative member or school uh, teacher to stand up if you're or here. Or board member, or board member. Well, I was going to ask, I was going to call Carrie out separately. <laughs> so um, anybody that works for the district, please stand up and let us say thank you for your work. Good.
and please go back and tell your peers how much your community truly does appreciate the work that you've done. And then Carrie, would you please stand? Um, is are any other school board members here? I didn't see anybody. No. Before. Okay, Carrie, thank you so much. <laughs> this is not easy work. I've had so many people tell me that the years that they've been around Oklahoma City and watched the school board, that this is the strongest, most courageous effort that they've seen the school board make. So thank you so much for your leadership for that. Um, so questions. I'm, I'm sure that this smart group has got some questions of the superintendent. So staff, you guys be ready. I wasn't, I wasn't gonna do that to you. I wasn't gonna embarrass <laughs> you like she did. But now that you've been embarrassed, and you're gonna That's help right. me answer questions. So, any questions? Not a okay, so question. I've, I've got something I, I think might, you might want to elaborate on. Okay. Um, so as you look at expanding or reconfiguring some of the elementary schools to middle schools, okay. we know that that's really where group activities, team sports, really starts taking a hold and those kids start feeling, having a sense of belonging. Um, talk to us a little bit about the plans that are in, in play to help make that come to fruition for next school year? So generally, we, we have, as you might imagine, lots of different project teams in place with team leaders. Uh, this represents a lot of work between March 5th, right, and August 12th. Um, know that behind the scenes, we have all the project teams in place. We have sent out uh, RFIs, RFPs, we have, uh, taken bids at some level on the work that has to be done. A lot of behind the scenes work, so that it's really not vote March 4th, okay, let's get started. A lot of this is, we have the best, my opinion, I think I can back this up, the best chief financial officer and finance team in the country, right here in Oklahoma City Public Schools. So there is a detailed uh, financial analysis of everything that you might imagine this represents. So, specifically, uh, project teams are in place. We're looking at converting an elementary to a middle. Well, how in the heck do you do that? Well, it's things like raising toilets, it's raising water fountains, it's raising sinks, it's taking care of practice fields uh, on, the, on the outside of the building. Um, we already have scope and sequence in place. We have partners in place. Uh, you may be familiar with Fields and Futures, one of our fantastic partners in district. And they are standing ready to come in and begin the dirt work on all of our soon-to-be middle schools. Um, so behind the scenes, project work, and just ready to kick it off uh, beginning March 5th. Yeah, Excellent. great question. Okay. Other questions? Hi. Um, my name is Nick Bartell. Uh, I work for... Lyric Theaters uh, of Oklahoma. Uh, I'm also a previous middle school teacher, and uh, I, I think this is really, really interesting. You've talked a lot about what, what you guys have to do and, and the work that you guys need to do and the schools need to do. Right. Um, in your opinion, what do you think, I think schools are a community thing. Um, what is the responsibility of the people in this room, of the community to help this happen? Uh, and what is the responsibility of the state government to help make sure this happens as far as teacher retention, how they're treated, how they're spoken to? Uh, so what can everyone else do to help this succeed? So great set of questions. Let's start community, and then I'll move to legislature, government, etc. I have never, ever seen uh, or even imagined the depth of support for a school system that I see in this community. Um, and so when I talk about pockets of greatness, that is certainly one. We can go different areas of our district and see unbelievable, unmatched support for a school. What I'd like to do is replicate that district-wide. Because while we have that in some areas, lots of areas, there are other areas where not so much. Parent engagement is not so much. Um, and for good reason. I mean, if you know some of the community areas, um, they look different, they feel different, they have different sets of circumstances. So I would just encourage um, to take the skill sets that you and your employees have if you have a business or if you're an individual. What skills, what contributions can I make to one student, uh, to one class, to one school, uh, to a neighborhood, and take action. So take what we do well in pockets and let's, let's make this a district-wide effort to support our kids. You know, the truth of the matter is, you saw staff stand up, you saw board members, these are not our kids. These are our kids. 
I hear all the time from the workforce that your kids are not ready to come to me. They don't have the skills. They're just not ready. Well, these are our kids, and so let's do everything we can do collectively to support all of our kids. So that's one. Two, um, man, I, I am just, I am a glass half full guy. I'm very optimistic, but I'm reasonable. But I really feel optimistic right now about our legislature and about our governor. Um, now, just like me, if we don't follow through with this plan, I'm just the 15th guy in 19 years to be selling you something, right? So it's about follow through. I think the same is true with our legislature. And so it is our responsibility to hold them accountable, to let them know how we feel. How is this going to affect our kids, this particular set of bills, this conversation uh, that's going on? How is that going to impact our kids? We need to be vocal. We need to be present. Um, and we need to not accept last year as we finally made it. We, they did some great things. I think you, you saw that. They did some great things uh, collectively as a legislature with regard to public schools. But man, if, if they think for a second that's it, we're going to take a deep breath. And, man, and I don't think they believe that. I think they know that we're coming, that we can do better for our kids. And so I think it's pressure, visibility on the legislature, uh, collaboration with the legislature, and then as a community, let's take care of all of our kids. Um, great, great couple of questions. Other questions? Go ahead, you're close. Oh, thank you. How are we planning on funding all of these changes? We're already struggling sure. as a state to keep the teachers that we have here, and we're just losing so many. And I know that repurposing the schools isn't going to bring in a strong enough revenue to bring the level of teaching that we need into our public schools. So how are we going to fund this huge change? So a couple things I heard there that I want to address. One is just whether we're going through a reinvention process or not, it's that year after year after year, figuring out a way to appeal to teachers to come to us. Right now, we have 336 emergency certified teachers in our district. Um, and so, regardless of this, we've got to address that. And so that comes through recruiting. That comes through uh, the best compensation package in the metropolitan area, maybe in the state. Uh, it comes through lowering class sizes. It comes through having a school where if I'm looking to go teach, I look and say, man, that looks like a pretty good opportunity for me. We think we're going to get to some of that through Pathway to Greatness. When you talk about the funding piece, um, and I'm not going to get too deep here, but you guys will get this. There, there are two real major types of funds that we look at. One is one-time funding. And one-time funding in Pathway to Greatness would be things like going into a school that's an elementary and creating a maker space. Uh, or raising a toilet or a sink or a water fountain. Or those one-time expenditures, and we have one-time funds that are called bond funds for those purposes, okay? So in 07, and again in 16, we had bond elections. We met the obligations uh, for those funds, and we have balances. And those balances are one-time expenditure monies that we're gonna use on the one-time expenditures to get our schools ready to go. The other piece is what we would call reoccurring expenses. So when I say we're going to have a counselor, a, a, ma a music teacher, an art teacher, et cetera, in every building, that's a, a debt. That's a reoccurring expense we take on. We pay for reoccurring things with reoccurring dollars. So when I close a school, I no longer pay for utilities. I no longer pay a custodian. I no longer pay a head principal. I no longer pay insurance. So I use those reoccurring dollars to pay for the reoccurring trade-ups that I'm bringing on board. So reoccurring dollars for reoccurring items, one-time money bond dollars for one-time things. And collectively, uh, we have a complete financial analysis. Yes, it's, it's the balance. So that we can take care of not just the one-time, let's get ready for school, but also planting all of these great teachers, additional teachers uh, into our schools. So really, really good question. That's something that you haven't seen that you will see as we deliver tomorrow, a financial analysis that responds to that. So thank you for that. That's good. Really good. Other questions? 
Okay, I'm sure. Go ahead. Oh. We got a follow up oh. there. Um, I was really interested in uh, t finding those top administrative team and assigning those to the schools that have the most needs. Right. Um, evaluation systems in schools are always debated amongst the people sure. doing the evaluation sure. and the people being evaluated. Uh, what evaluation means are you using to find those top administrative teams? Um, and they're going to be put into really challenging situations. Yep. So how are you going to be pitching that to them as, you know, you're the best of the best, so here's a hard job. And you might not see any financial recompense. And even the best of the best are, are tired and, and working hard. And their reward is going to be a challenge that I'm sure many of them will want to undertake. Um, but what is that process looking like? So if I'm a principal, if I'm a principal, uh, so, so let me back up. Principal, assistant principal, and then a grade level teacher for each grade level in a building. Okay, those are going to be our transformational teams. Um, we're using a series of uh, criteria. So part of it is the, the TLE, the evalu evaluation system we currently use. Uh, we have looked at national associations and we've borrowed from University of Virginia, uh, Dallas, those who have had success in transformational models. And then we've attached a little thing called a stipend to their salary that's substantial. And so uh, we believe that the combination of the challenge, high performers are usually challenged by this kind of thing. Uh, they want to take it on. And so that combined with the stipend piece and the three-year commitment from the district for training, uh, for investment, for resources, uh, we think we're going to find some, some really, really effective. You know, and the hope is, this is my hope, that they're internal candidates. We love to grow our own and, and then place them where they think they can be effective, but we have not limited it to internal candidates. Great question. Good. Other questions? Superintendent, thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Appreciate you. Thank oh, you got it. Yeah, I don't want you to meet it. We not only appreciate your energy and your passion, your commitment to our district, to our kids, and frankly, for taking, taking this on, this is not, this is not a, a, an easy project. And um, you started this work just a few days into your tenure at Oklahoma City as it was, superintendent. It was day so. two, actually. <laughs> day two, exactly. My first of 38 was day two. <laughs> wow. Well, you know, who knows what's from here, but thank you so much. Um, so let's also give a round of applause of thanks to our two sponsors again today, ADG and Cox for helping to make this lunch possible. Um, we are uh, excited to announce that Governor Kevin Stitt will be joining us for the first ever Chairman's Breakfast event on Thursday, March 7th at the Cox Center. So if you haven't already gotten your tickets, please do um, get your tickets so that you can join us for that. And please do, if you have some time and are, and are interested more in um, the comments and the presentation that the superintendent made today, take a look at the website and learn a little bit more so that you can answer questions and hopefully help advocate for this change. Thank you so much for joining us today and we will see you next time.